Hi, everyone. Hey, I see a lot of nice uh, messages already from everyone. Welcome to tonight's class. Um, I tried to upload this uh, slide presentation into the actual uh, program. Unfortunately, it's too big. I have too many pictures. So I'm having to show it to you, um, showing you it from the actual uh, uh, PowerPoint program, which you can see the kind of the windows around it, but you'll still be able to see the pictures and uh, we'll still have a good good discussion. So welcome everybody. We're gonna talk about aromatherapy for body, mind, spirit, but this is also an introduction to the whole concept of energetic aromatherapy. And energetic aromatherapy is, is uh, uh, my approach to aromatherapy. I talked a little bit about this um, in my free emotional healing classes, uh, but that was before I actually finalized our uh, aromatherapy for emotional healing charts. And so I've made a few changes to this. So we're gonna do three things tonight. We're gonna start off by talking about some of the basic principles and um, how essential oils are used and what they do. We're gonna get into heavily into the energetics of essential oils, uh, kind of introducing the whole energetic model I use on our aromatherapy chart. And then we're gonna do some practical suggestions. So aromatherapy is basically the use of essential oils from plants, uh, also called volatile oils. Uh, they are uh, what give plants fragrances. And so a lot of people have a mistaken notion that the uh, lavender oil and the herb, lavender herb have the same uh, properties. Not exactly, because the essential oil is a, an isolated extract from a plant. It is not the whole plant and therefore it can't have all of the same properties that the whole plant has because you're only extracting the one portion of the plant. It would be like saying uh, that because I extracted some tannins from white oak bark, that the tannin would have all the property of white oak bark. It doesn't work that way. Now, essential oils can be used uh, to assist physical healing, but the way I first really started using them was to enhance mood and uh, help with uh, emotional healing. Um, they also can be used in personal care products and around the home. So there's a lot of uses for essential oils and they've become very, very popular in, in recent years. Um, I, the, what makes them a volatile or essential oils is that they evaporate in the presence of heat. You, um, uh, a fixed vegetable oil uh, will not evaporate, okay? Uh, but an essential oil or a volatile oil um, is a different kind of oil. It doesn't mix very well with water, but it still uh, is not like a fixed oil or a fat. Now, uh, volatile oils dissolve really well in fixed oils, which is why you can mix them to make massage lotions and so forth. They also are soluble in alcohol, except when I first took my first aromatherapy course from uh, a uh, Sufi healer from the Middle East uh, who I went by the name of Hakim Shisti, he said that what the problem with alcohol is a solvent for essential oils. And that's what uh, all perfumes are basically using is alcohol to dissolve the essential oils in the perfume. It splits the components of the essential oil apart into their individual compounds, thereby destroying some of the synergy of the essential oil uh, and making it so that it doesn't have quite the same subtle properties, especially for emotional healing. And so I think uh, my, I've ob observed that uh, they actually dissolve much better in glycerin or in um, um, uh, fat, uh, fats. Now, all essential oils, because they are a particular type of constituent from a plant, have some very similar properties. Pretty much most essential oils are going to have some disinfectant, antiseptic, antibacterial, antiviral, or antifungal properties. And they typically exert these in parts per million. So it only takes a little teeny bit to actually have an inhibiting effect on many harmful microorganisms. At the same time, most of them stimulate the body's own immune defenses. And almost all of them have effects on the nervous system and the glandular system. And I'll explain why that is in uh, a moment. And uh, especially effects on the sympathetic or parasympathetic nervous system, which is why some oils are stimulating and invigorating uh, and other oils, oh, um, huh. 
Somebody says they can't hear me, but it shows my microphone being on. Is there anybody else who can't hear me? Um, because it looks like the signal's good and the sound should be on. Anyway, uh, if you can hear me, just type a message, say I can hear you. So I guess I guess there's a problem with some people with sound, but other people are having problems with sound. Not sure why that's the case. Okay. Um, so um, because of their effects on the nervous system, they also affect a lot of other uh, body processes, particularly circulation and digestion. And they also can stimulate cell growth, helping to uh, have tissues heal. But one of their biggest things is they have a profound effect on our mood and our emotions uh, because they actually affect very directly our hormones and neurotransmitters. Now, why this is the case um, is, is because of their effect on the limbic system, which I'll discuss in a moment. Now, I started using essential oils in the 1980s. Uh, I, I started off with peppermint oil and tea tree oil and a couple of basic oils, a blend called Taifu. Um, and then uh, I became acquainted with uh, the idea of subtle aromatherapy. And I took a, an aromatherapy class from this Hakim Chisti from the Middle East about the, the uh, spiritual, mental, emotional properties of essential oils. This was in the late 80s. I also had a friend, Lauren Carl Robinson, who was really big into essential oils. And he was actually starting to use them in the late 80s internally and was teaching me about internal uh, uses of essential oils. So, and, and in the early 90s, we actually formulated a lot of herbal products in which we added essential oils. So I have experience going way back with the um, use of essential oils for mind and mood, but also the use of essential oils both internally and topically. Now, I primarily, based on my experience, reserve the use of essential oils to be either inhaled or to be applied topically. And even when I'm applying topically, I normally dilute them. Um, and if I want to use oils to help with internal problems, I typically dilute them in a fixed vegetable oil and I rub them over the part of the body that I want to affect. So if I want to do something with the tummy, I mix up the oils for the tummy with a little bit of olive oil or almond oil or other fixed vegetable oil and rub it over the tummy or rub it over the throat. And the reason why is because I learned that essential oils penetrate rather rapidly through the skin in reasonable therapeutic doses and without causing irritation to the gastrointestinal tract or other problems. And because they're entering into the area that you're trying to affect, I think they actually work better that way. There are many essential oils that are actually toxic for internal use, so that um, uh, avoids having to worry about that. And I rarely use essential oils internally. What uh, what we found out was when we um, when we did the herbal formulas with essential oils, we were typically putting one to two drops of an of a blend of several essential oils into uh, one ounce of an herbal formula. And we found that that was way too strong for many people. Many people found that irritating to their gastrointestinal tracts. Now that, that's, that's like one ounce of a formula where you're gonna take like, like 30 to 40 drops of that formula or, or maybe half a teaspoon. That's not even a full drop of essential oil per dose. It was still irritating to people. And we actually found we had to cut it down to like maybe one drop for every two ounces of the formula or e even one drop for every four ounces of the formula to, to get um, um, that to work properly. That's why I decided you have to be really careful about using them internally. Now, when you inhale them, okay, so I talked about top using them topically or inhaling them, the neurons responsible for the sense of smell tie directly into what's called the limbic system of the brain, which has also been called your mammalian brain, and it's the emotional center of the brain. And the neurons travel back there, and that directly connects into what's called the, the hypothalamus, which is where the pituitary gland is. 
And so it literally from that point, it's like the center of your brain and the switching station for all other parts of your brain. So that literally will send signals to other parts of the brain or activate specific hormones to be released by the pituitary into the bloodstream to affect your hormones. So the net effect is, is that essential oils have very immediate, uh, almost instantaneous, when a few seconds, effects on hormones and neurotransmitters, which directly affects mood and the way the body balances. And that's not even ingesting them, that's just smelling them. And we all experience that in nature when we you know, smell something either good or bad, and we immediately have something going on in our feelings. So I really like essential oils for that uh, particular purpose. Now, um, there are a number of ways of, of extracting essential oils, um, and certain things like rose are extracted by rolling flower petals in fats, okay? Uh, there's also solvent extracts, which are basically using some kind of solvent to do this, but this is uh, uh, not does not produce the highest quality oils. Most of the qu more better quality oils are produced by steam distillation. Some are cold pressed, and there's also a process called CO2, which actually makes some really wonderful essential oils. Uh, CO2 chamomile is, is, is an amazing oil uh, that's out there. Now, a couple of myths. There is no trusted third party or government ag agency that monitors essential oils providing any kind of grade for them. So all of your, your terms for essential oils are internal to, to specific companies. Um, the, th so therefore, uh, there's a lot of marketing hype about oils. You just have to look at the company and you have to really look at how they handle their quality control because there's a lot of adulteration in the essential oil market. So you really have to be careful uh, what companies use. And, and you really do want to use natural oils. Why not just use anything that smells nice? Well, there, there is an aspect of the life force or energetic of the oils. Oh, by the way, I forgot to do one thing really quickly. Um, I forgot to share the handouts. So there, I just turned on the file sharing for the handouts. Apologize, I didn't do that earlier, everybody. Uh, but uh, uh, it, it, you can download and uh, the, the handouts. And, and when, I, when I put up the, re the recording here, um, I will also provide a link to the handouts so that you can actually go and, and study this you know, uh, as, as you want. Now, the idea of energetic aromatherapy is that, the, and it, it relates to the way I approach herbs, okay? When I first started learning herbalism, what you have is you have a list of illnesses and problems, and then people lift different herbs and remedies to, to treat for them, the disease treatment approach. And then they do the same thing with uh, the herbs. They list the herb and they list a bunch of diseases it's been used for. I, I've never liked that approach because it doesn't help you understand when, what the remedy is doing or why you're using it. Now, so I have been teaching for years about classifications of herbs, astringents, aromatics, pungent herbs, et cetera, and how those apply therapeutically to changing things in the body. So you recognize when you need to shift a particular um, uh, thing in the body, you understand the type of remedy that, you're, that you need to use. And you can pick from among several different remedies that may do that. And that's my same approach to aromatherapy. I don't like the approach of, of listing all these essential oils and then trying to memorize all the different properties of them. I want people to understand the basic qualities of the essential oils so that they can, they can understand the different types of oils and what the application is for different types. So if you don't happen to have this oil, what are some other oils that have that quality and how can you use them? Now, oils have levels of fragrance because like a, an herb, they have multiple constituents. They're not a single compound. And so they have what are called notes. There's a top note, a middle note, and a 
on a deep note. Uh, and, and that has to do with the initial reaction of the fragrance, then kind of the more uh, uh, longer term reaction, and then finally the, the longest reaction. And it's sort of like um, in music, you know, you have different chords, different layers of, of music. So an essential oil is more like a, a symphony. It's got a number of different properties, but it still has a dominant note and then kind of uh, secondary notes. And so we can classify these and understand them according to basic energetic patterns. And that's where this particular wheel comes in. Now, the history of this is that um, when I was working with uh, uh, Carl, um, he created a, a basic aromatherapy wheel that, that we used. And I worked with Kimberly Ballas and and we put together an aromatherapy course. And I'd had that wheel for since, oh, the, the late 90s, uh, maybe even the mid 90s. But when I got to looking at it, and I was revising it, and it had a lot more experience with oils. I basically uh, decided that there were some things in it that didn't uh, quite jive for me. And so I started basically redoing it. And uh, with the help of my son, David, we came up with this oil with uh, this this chart which has you know uh, this very nice color graphic which is on our aromatherapy for emotional healing chart now what we've got here is we have basically eight basic qualities of essential oils in aromatherapy that correlate to the idea of yin and yang and the four elements and also correlate to 16 basic qualities of fragrances, 16 different types of aromas that have these properties. So uh, we're, the, the properties are ethereal, refreshing, stimulating, invigorating, grounding, sultry, um, soothing, and calming. Now, some of the changes that we made to this were, for example, uh, Carl had narcotic where we have soothing. And I just looked at that. That just do, didn't really make sense to me. And narcotic is not associated with what really the quality is. I moved a few of the categories around uh, based on how the oils work. And I'm going to go over this chart with you and help you understand these qualities of fragrance. Um, and I've got a, a little bit of a close up here so you can see uh, the, the, the chart a little bit better on the inside. And I'm starting off with the idea of the yin and yang symbol in the middle. So yin, which is associated in Chinese medicine with water being cold and damp and fire being hot and dry is also associated with the basic two divisions of our autonomic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system, which fires us up and the parasympathetic, which relaxes us. So those oils that tend to have a more stimulating, invigorating, uh, energizing effect are more fiery or more young, and they tend to be more sympathetic stimulating, whereas those oils that are more uh, soothing, calming, uh, and uh, uh, sedating, are, are more parasympathetic in nature and tend to stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system. Now, one thing that's really cool about this is that um, you can actually um, determine this with the pupil. Because if you are, look into someone's eyes and you look at their pupils, you, you shine a little flashlight in from the side. I'm an iridologist, so you do this, you shine a little flashlight in from the side. And then all you have to do is waif an essential oil under their nose and watch their pupil while they're smelling it. If their pupil gets a little bigger, okay, and it'll just go kind of go like that, um, that means that the essential oil is activating the sympathetic branch of the nervous system because the sympathetic branch of the nervous system dilates the pupil. 
if while you're looking in the eye and they smell the oil and the pupil tends to get a little smaller, it is activating the parasympathetic nervous system. Now, essential oils don't always act precisely the same way from person to person. And there's a reason for that. And it's because of, of smells association to memory. So for example, if you had a bad experience in which you also smelled a certain smell that would normally be uh, a parasympathetic or, or calming smell, but you smelled that fragrance in conjunction with something that was scary, bad, or negative. When you smell that, your association of that smell with that experience will cause it to act as a sympathetic stimulant. So the, the action of essential oils, while there's a general action for the majority of people, is also somewhat subjective due to associations with smell. For example, one of my ex-wives hated roses. She hated the smell of roses. She never wanted me to bring her roses. Roses made her feel stressed. Now, the reason why roses made her feel stressed is because her dad died when she was five years old and she went to the funeral and she was very close to her dad and the whole place was filled with roses and the smell of roses. So roses stressed her because it reminded her, even though rose is actually can be a very comforting fragrance to people who are grieving and so forth, rose put her in touch with emotions she didn't want to feel and therefore her body reacted in a stress or alarm way to the smell of rose, which is actually normally a very floral, calming scent for most people. So that's very, very important to understand when you're dealing with aromatherapy, that little bit of subjectivity. And that's why knowing something as simple as being able to have someone smell the essential oil and see how it affects their pupil is helpful for basically customizing what essential oils are going to be particularly good for this, this person. Those oils which tend to smell the best to you are going to balance out the energy of your nervous system and glandular system, and therefore are good for you. Now, one of the other things that we learn to do is this. When you smell an oil, there's a tendency either that you lean into it, you, you, you want to take it in, or for an oil that's having a negative effect, that's throwing your body farther out of balance, you go like this and, and you go, and there's a, a, a sense of, of the, the head jerking back, okay? And, and pulling away from the scent. And again, that shows that that particular oil is not having a balancing effect on your nervous system. Now, this is the forces of duality. Yin draws in. Yin aids assimilation. It aids relaxation. It, it aids sleep and calmness. Yang is the discharge of energy. It's activity and so forth. And so the middle of the chart shows that yin-yang symbol. And that relates to this sympathetic parasympathetic nervous system thing. So the yang is the more sympathetic. It is more associated with the time of day, being alert, being awake, being focused, being excited, and the enlarged pupil. Whereas yin is more parasympathetic, associated with nighttime and being more relaxed, rested, or calm, and the contracted pupil. So there's a balance between those two. And the first thing that you can do with essential oils is to balance out the nervous system. You have people who are sympathetic dominant and you have people who are parasympathetic dominant. And if you are a, a sympathetic dominant person, then a, a par, oils that calm down the sympathetic nervous system and, and bring up the parasympathetic nervous system will make you feel more balanced. The converse is true. If you're parasympathetic dominant, then oils that calm the parasympathetic and stimulate the sympathetic will make you feel more balanced. So that's what the center of this chart is showing is the yin or yang, and which is the sympathetic or parasympathetic. The next line is the, is the Western four elements. And the, the Western four elements have to do with a, a little bit larger cycle that includes the idea of yin and yang. But 
If you think of the lungs drawing in air, that's the yin, as it reaches a, a fullness of expansion, then it switches and starts to change to contraction, which is putting out, pushing out the air, and then it stops at the bottom in a state of rest or equilibrium. So you go, and there's a pause. That's the cycle of the four elements. Air is the change from water to fire. It's expanded to its greatest level of expansion, its most diffuse energy, and then it begins to contract or consolidate and discharge energy coming back to a state of rest. So fire is yang. It represents contraction force and the discharge of energy. Earth represents the discharged energy being empty, being a state of rest, being a state of, of a temporary balance before the yin energy, which draws in or expands and attracts, uh, expands. And then when it reaches fullness, it shifts. And that's shown on these charts, okay? So the water or yin is basically aiding assimilation, creation and storage of energy associated with nighttime and winter promotes rest and relaxation, playfulness, peace, openness, softness, gentleness, and sensitivity. Whereas the fire side aids elimination, breakdown and discharge of energy is associated with daytime and summer, promotes activity and alertness, aids work direction and assertiveness, promotes hardness, firmness, and self-containment. Now, the other polarities, the, the so that's the fire and water, the yin and yang, the air and the earth basically have to do with a shift from absorption to discharge associated with the early morning or the springtime of the year when everything wakes up. That helps co clear congestion, or which is fullness too much, and start relieving stuffiness and stagnation, initiating detoxification, promoting a feeling of letting go, opening up, and being more free, having a new renewal, a new beginning. The earth side of the equation is a shift from discharge, meaning emptying out, to beginning to absorb again, which is associated with evening or autumn or fall, when everything is kind of dying back to the earth and the earth is going to a state of rest. It helps to clear emptiness, weakness, and malnourishment, and initiates or begins the cycle of absorption and assimilation which is uh, op feelings of desire and connection and, and, uh, uh, and associated with contemplation, satisfaction, and receiving. So uh, on this chart, you see these four quadrants, you see? That's the air, water, fire, and earth. And that's what that is referring to. This, these are promoters of change. And if this is a cycle. You see the arrows going around the outside edge? These, these essential oils are shifting energy around this cycle of life from a starting place, moving it forward in the progression of energy. So that's one of the things that we're, we're showing in this chart. Now, also um, what we do in, on, our, on the chart that we created, the wheel, is we're also putting in about the emotions. And I created this emotional model, which is based on um, the idea that you have three primary emotions that say we're emotionally out of balance. One is anger, the other was grief, and the other one is fear. And then you have secondary emotions, which are which happen when you you suppress or deny the primary emotion, which when you suppress the fire or the anger, you wind up feeling depressed or jealous. When you suppress the grief, you wind up feeling hardness or hatred. And when you compress, suppress or, or deny the fear, you wind up with compulsions and addictions, um, which, is, which is feeling stuck, which actually should, uh, should, I should say suppress fear, which is earth, earth, not air. So also in this chart, you see the little wheel here? Okay, vented means that the person is actively engaged in the emotion. Suppression means they're in denial of it. So the, the oils in that area that's shown by the yellow 
when a person is feeling fearful, acutely fearful, those oils help to calm and deal with the fear. When a person is in denial of their fear, suppressing their fear, which makes them addictive, compulsive, or reckless, these oils up here will balance that. And the same thing is for the grief and the, 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 when a person's actively grieving, these oils up going into this bluish phase of the cycle are very helpful for grieving. When a person has suppressed or denied their grief, the oils down here will help them. When a person is acutely uh, angry, these oils over here can help to calm them down. But when they've suppressed their anger, these oils can help them get in touch with their sense of anger and personal power. So that's also shown on this wheel. And as I've already mentioned, it's important to note that these, these can be somewhat subjective um, because of the association with, um, with memory. So generally speaking, what you're looking for is this is kind of a basic guide to using oils, but the ultimate thing of what oils to use are you figure out what oils actually help the person feel good. So now let's talk about how you use them. I have a, 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 a model that I've created in herbalism of four degrees of action. And those four degrees of action have to do with the uh, level of remedy. A lot of people think, okay, it, anything that's natural is good. It can't hurt you, blah, 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 blah. Well, that's, that's obviously not true. There are poisonous plants out there. So this model basically indicates there Thing, remedies that have a first degree of action are things that you can consume for food. You can consume for fuel, meaning they've got a significant amount of fats, proteins, or carbohydrates that your body can burn for energy. And they're completely safe to eat in large quantities. Now, all foods have an impact on your energy, but it's a very subtle impact. In the second degree are medicinal foods, which are usually used as spices or seasonings. So while we don't normally sit down and eat a plate full of lemons, although some people like like to eat lemons. We usually use a little bit of lemon juice or a little bit of cinnamon or something. We don't eat it in large quantities. They're perfectly safe. People use, eat them all the time, but they're in smaller quantities, but they are used as part of food. In the third degree, there's medicinal herbs. These are things that we would never eat as food, like cascara sagrada as a laxative or lobelia as an emetic or, or strong uh, relaxant. And those things are helpful for helping a person recover when they're sick, but they're not something you're going to take long term. There is also a fourth degree, which is toxic botanicals and drugs. Now, toxic botanicals are plants that if can cause addiction or, or harm if misused, and they, they can be used by people for in severe situations, but they have to be really skilled in knowing how to do them. Externally, Essential oils act mostly in the second and third degree, meaning that you can, you know, especially diluted, you can safely use essential oils topically for just enjoyment or for restoring your body. But if you move to the internal use of essential oils, it's third or fourth degree, meaning that, that some oils are actually poisonous internally and really shouldn't be used at all. But all oils used internally are medicinal and should be used for short periods of time for specific therapeutic use by people who know what they're doing. So because they're highly concentrated, they can cause skin and eye irritation and have some toxic toxicity. So you have to use them safely. So when it, uh, it says that an oil can be used neat, that means that you can take the oil and you can apply it topically without diluting it. And even though that's true that the oil can be used neat, I have seen even neat oils cause redness or irritation to the skin, and I don't think that's a good idea. So most of the time when you're applying oils topically, you want to dilute them, okay? And, uh, and that's just you know to make it easier on the client. You can dilute them in vegetable oils, you can dilute them in natural liquid soaps. You can dilute them in unscented lotions or shampoos or salves. You can dilute them in water if you mix them first with glycerin or liquid soap. And uh, we also use oils in uh, an enzyme spray called Nature's Fresh that, that we get from Nature Sunshine. 
And what you want when you're diluting the oils, you want the oils to be 2 to 3% of the finished product. So this is a handy little dilution table. Um, and like I said, if you download the handouts, you'll get this dilution table that shows you how much oil you need to add to how much of the liquid to get that, uh, get a 2.5% dilution. So that's right between 2 and 3%, which is really good. So you see one teaspoon, it's only two to three drops of oil. Uh, one tablespoon is seven to eight drops. Two tablespoons, about 15 drops. One cup, about one-fifth of an ounce, which is about 1.25 teaspoons, so forth. So now, again, you want to use your own intuition and smell when you're doing this. Um, uh, Get and, and we can uh, and adjust that so you can adjust it slightly up or slightly down depending on how you're doing it. And for anybody who's having a hard time uh, hearing, I am assuming that this uh, is being uh, properly recorded. It's set to actually broadcast simultaneously on YouTube and recorded on YouTube. And so the recording will be available. And everyone who registered for this program, I will be sending you the link to the, the program, and I also will be sending you a link to the handouts. So you can download these handouts uh, and follow along with this. So uh, it, it's good. Now, diffusion is another very safe way to use essential oils. Generally, you're going to diffuse oils for you know a, a limited period of time, between 50 maybe and 30 minutes maximum because you don't want to sit there and run your diffuser all day and all night long. You want to run it for a short period of time uh, because it doesn't take a lot of essential oil getting into the air to do this. Now that can freshen the air and, and, and enhance a person's mood, but it also can kill air, airborne microbes. And the inhalation, just like essential oils penetrate through the skin into the bloodstream, they penetrate through the lungs into the bloodstream. So therefore, you are getting the internal benefits of essential oils by diffusing them or applying them topically without having to worry about ingesting them and, and, and causing a potential problem irritating the gastrointestinal mucosa. Uh, there are several ways to diffuse them. You can get nice commercial diffusers or just put a few drops into a pot of boiling water and diffuse them in the steam. Or there's also a little aroma lamps or rings you can buy that you put a few drops in. It has a candle underneath it, and it just lets the oil evaporate into the room. Similar to using oils for um, um, diffusion is you could make what's called a hydrosol. A hydrosol is basically putting the essential oils into a little bit of water or, or something so you can spray it. And, and diffuse it to, to uh, real quickly. You can make a little disinfectant spray or you can make a, a spray for emotional healing. Um, and what you wanna do is you, uh, there's these glycerin-based flower essences that I created for Nature Sunshine, which you can mix the oils with, or you can just use a little teeny bit of glycerin. And that's really the best thing to do. You dilute the oils first in some glycerin, and then you add them to the water and shake it up. And glycerin is a really good solvent for essential oils. Um, I've, I've used glycerin this way, and it's probably, I think, one of the best solvents and, and helps them mix with the water. Uh, but you still have to shake it a little bit with each use. Um, and then you can spray it. You can use it kind of like a perfume, you know. Um, you also can make like a, a perfume oil by... Um, the, the best thing to do is add just a little bit of an oil, uh, a, a massage oil, uh, and add the EOs to the massage oil, and then put it in a little clear roll-on bottle, and then you can roll that onto your wrists or uh, the points right here. When I took my aromatherapy class from Hakim Chisti, he, he said that, that two really good places to apply essential oils, if you want to get them so that they're going into your bloodstream, is to put them here, like which is what you often do with perfumes, right? Testing the smell, you put it right there. 
but that's where we take the pulse. So there's a blood vessel right there. You put that oil there and it goes in. The other one is right here. Now it's interesting that we people intuitively use perfumes and colognes here and here, okay? So when you're using essential oils that way, you put them here and here, and they actually have internal therapeutic properties because they readily get into the bloodstream. Um, someone asked a question, should people with respiratory conditions like asthma avoid infusers? diffusers? No, actually diffusing essential oils, the right essential oils, the ones that are opening up, the ones in the kind of the, the what I call labels, the air quadrant, actually can be very helpful for asthma because they open up the lungs. Okay, so you just have to choose the right oils for that. Um, you can also use oils in baths or soaks. Um, and again, this is both a, a respiratory thing, you're smelling the oil, and it's also a therapeutic thing. You're putting a little bit through your skin into the, uh, the bloodstream by just taking a bath. Now, again, you need to get the oil to dissolve in the water so you get an unscented natural liquid soap, okay? like Dr. Bronner's super mild baby soap. You put, put, put some in your hand, in your palm of your hand, drop the oils into that, mix them into that, and then hold that hand under the running water, okay? And that allows the oils to diffuse through the bath. And uh, you can also put the oils onto Epsom salts. So you get a cup of Epsom salts or two cups of Epsom salts for an Epsom salt bath, put the oils onto the Epsom salts, and the Epsom salts will help to disperse the oils in the bath, which is really great because uh, Epsom salt is magnesium sulfate, and that's really good with relaxing essential oils, like things like lavender and rose and everything to help you unwind at the end of the day. So you can do that either in a bath or you can do that like if you wanna do a foot soak with essential oils, that's another really good way to use them. Um, now, if you are going to use oils internally, like I said, you could get that benefit by, you know, mixing it with a fixed oil or, or, or something and apply it over the area where we have. So like, for example, I've put oils, made a little massage mixture of, uh, oils with a little bit of, uh, massage oil or something. And I've applied it topically to the throat for sore throats. I've, rubbed it in over lymphatic congestion. I've taken oils that settle the stomach for a little kid and diluted them and rubbed them over the tummy. You can uh, take oils that help expel parasites or fungal infections, rub them over the abdomen. You can, uh, you can put them over where the problem is and they readily absorb through the bloodstream into that area. But if you are going to use them internally, and sometimes I have used them internally, you should always dilute them more than the 2.5% dilution, more like a 1% dilution. And you should uh, not take them internally more than twice daily. And I don't recommend doing that for more than a week. Now, I've used a blend of essential oils, um, and I may have a recipe for that later, for a thrush where you mix the oils with a, a tablespoon of uh, olive oil and you give one drop twice a day. And it works really well. You don't have to do a lot. So you can add one drop to one or two teaspoons of honey. You can add one, one to two drops to one or to two cups of a beverage that has fat in it, like almond or coconut milk. You can dilute the e-oils in olive oil, about 10 drops per tablespoon, and then take one drop per dose um, and again, don't do that except for short-term periods. And I recommend having some, um, you know, really making sure you know what you're doing. So let's talk about some just really, really practical ways to use essential oils. These are so based on the kind of things we did. Let's let's look at this. So, want to use oils to help prevent infection? Antiseptic. Uh, and disinfectant soaps, antimicrobial soaps, actually are not even recommended by the FDA and everything because, number one, they kill good bacteria along with harmful bacteria. They cause bacteria to become antibiotic resistant. 
uh, microbes do not become resistant to essential oils for some reason, probably because essential oils are very complex and they're always a little bit different from year to year. So the microbes can never fully adapt to them, whereas chemical disinfectants, the microbes tend to adapt to. So if you want to make a disinfectant soap, you uh, get an unscented natural liquid soap and you add the oils in the dilution, uh, a dilution about one teaspoon to eight ounces. Now, the chart, the refreshing stimulating oils are the ones in the air quadrant. And the one oils that I put in the air quadrant are the ones that tend to have the highest my, antimicrobial activity. And they include eucalyptus pine, rosemary, oh, I got pine on there twice, tea tree and thyme as examples, okay? So those are really good oils. Now you can also use those same oils to inhibit the spread of infectious disease. So besides being able to use them as a, um, as a natural soap, you can also diffuse them. So like, okay, somebody in your family is sick and you don't want everybody else to get sick, you basically get your diffuser and you diffuse some of those oils into the air. It only takes a few parts, you know, a couple of parts per million and it knocks out the bacteria and inhibits the spread of infection. This actually has been proven in hospitals to work. And if you're concerned about getting an infection when you're traveling or, or away from home, you simply make a hydrosol of those oils and you can spray it around yourself while you're on the plane, uh, or spray a little on your face, spray it in your hotel room or whatever. But again, it's the oils that are in the refreshing to stimulating uh, category that work the best for this. Now, essential oils um, can be very helpful for treatment of wounds. Um, excuse me. Um, the uh, uh, I was once talking to a medical doctor and he said, it's really best not to put anything disinfectant on a wound because the, all the disinfectants kill like iodine and mercurochrome and all that stuff. They kill the healthy cells along with bacteria and make the wound heal slower. And I said, well, I know stuff that will um, kill the bacteria. It will also help the wound heal faster. And he says, I don't, he says really? And I said, yeah, for example, tea tree oil. Um, there are quite a few essential oils that have what are called cicatricent properties, which means they, they stimulate the tissue helping wounds to heal. They also happen to be disinfectant or antiseptic. So if you've got some kind of a cut or a wound and you're concerned about it getting infected, um, you could apply some essential oils uh, uh, a little bit to the wound. Uh, I, I feel safe in admitting this now, but at the time I would have never have said anything to anyone because of the thing. But I had a, one of my kids who stepped on a nail and none of my kids were vaccinated. And I thought, well, I don't want to you know, have any problems with this. So I, I actually kept, I took silver, all right? And I put uh, mixed silver with essential oils um, and I put it on the, uh, the wound to trying to get it down into the wound as much as possible. Because remember, essential oils penetrate through the skin and into the local area of the tissue and they, it, they work in parts per million. So, you know, um, I figured that way, if there was any infection in there, it would kill it. Uh, and then I lied and told my neighbor that I'd taken him to the doctor for a tetanus shot, which I didn't do. But anyway, um, but I, I've seen this really, really work very, very effectively for both uh, wound disinfecting and also helping to heal wounds to heal. You, when tissues are healing, they have a higher, the frequency or a higher energy and the higher level essential oils, uh, energy and essential oils will stimulate that tissue healing. Now, when you talk about respiratory stuff, this, the oils again in that same quadrant of the air element are really helpful for dealing with respiratory congestion. Like, I learned this little trick from a, a chiropractor. When you have kids or, or somebody and you can hear that rattling in their lungs, meaning they've got congestion down in their lungs. And he said, just take a little olive oil and just rub it 
uh, on the, starting at their backbone in between their ribs and bring it around to their breastbone. Now, what that does is that stimulates lymphatic drainage, which helps to pull the congestion out of the lungs. And I thought, well, if that works, I'm going to use garlic because garlic is very uh, antiseptic. It absorbs through the skin. Uh, while you don't have a garlic essential oil, you do have garlic that's been basically diluted in olive oil, which has uh, uh, sulfur compounds that penetrate through the skin and especially go into the lungs. So I started using garlic oil, but that was really stinky. So I got instead the idea to use um, uh, the respiratory type er uh, herbs. Like So I would put a little eucalyptus or frankincense, pine, rosemary, thyme, those kind of oils, uh, dilute them into olive oil and rub them on the kid's chest and rub it again, causing doing a lymphatic drainage massage from the backbone around to the front. And I'd put the kid to bed and the next morning, and then I did this half a dozen times. And it, it worked every single time. Um, we wake up, the kids' lungs were clear in the morning. Um, so it's a great, great thing. Now, if you can also uh, take a bowl of really hot water, you drop the essential oils into the uh, bowl. You get a towel like it shows there. You pull the towel over and you inhale the steam. That moistens the lungs, puts the the disinfectant qualities of these oils straight into the lungs and is probably one of the very, very best therapies I know for clearing up infections in the lungs, including serious stuff. I mean, like this, this is something I wouldn't hesitate, I hesitate to use even in serious stuff like pneumonia. Now, essential oils could also be used as a gargle or a mouthwash. Uh, the in this case, the ones that work on the mouthwash actually go more into the fire category uh, with very yang, yang qualities. It's not so much the more ethereal ones that have an opening thing, which are really good for the lungs, and really good for decongesting the lymphatics and really good for kind of preventing infection. But these are actually a little better at topically killing germs. And they're in the more spicy to grounding category, like I said, the fire or yang category in, on the, the chart includes the things like cinnamon, clove, myrrh, rosemary, uh, pulls a, some of the oils from the uh, uh, air quadrant a little bit, but so forth. You basically can um, uh, put these in glycerin, add them to water, and then basically make your own mouthwash. And again, just use the dilution suggestion of like the two and a half percent that I mentioned earlier, just just take a couple of tablespoons of glycerin, dilute them in the glycerin, and then add them to the correct amount of water, and you have a mouthwash. Uh, you could also use that as a gargle and gargle with it for sore throats. You could also take those same oils, and I've done this too, just like doing the thing with the lungs. You dilute them in a carrier oil, and you do lymphatic drainage massage onto the throat like this. And if you just sit here and kind of massage the throat for about 15, 20 minutes with the, the oils and stuff like that, I, I have numerous, numerous times completely relieved a sore throat within that uh, time frame. Now, you can also add silver in making your mouthwash or gargle. So you can you can uh, uh, basically add uh, like let's say you're making eight ounces you'd find the correct amount of oil of um, of oils for for eight ounces because I don't have that on top of my head mix that in two or three tablespoons of glycerin and also mix in like uh, four or five six tablespoons of the uh, silver like Nature Sunshine Silver Shield or another kind of silver and then that makes your own great inexpensive homemade mouthwash um, or gargle. Now, settling the stomach. Now, the herbs that are best at settling the stomach fit in the ethereal area on the, on the chart, which is your fresh to minty. They're, they're coming out of the yin and moving into the air element. So they're a little bit decongesting, but they're also a little bit calming. And that includes things like peppermint, chamomile, bergamot, uh, lime, uh, spearmint. Uh, 
so you peppermint of course is one of the best and this is one case where i do use essential oils internally i put one drop of peppermint oil into a cup of warm or room temperature water and stir it up and then just take little teeny sips of it and you can also take the uh, liquid chlorophyll that uh, like Nature Sunshine has liquid chlorophyll that either has peppermint or spearmint oil in it. And you'd use it the same way. You just put the chlorophyll in the water. And because it's got a little bit of peppermint or a little bit of spearmint oil in it, it'll do the same thing. It'll help settle the stomach. Now, if you've got somebody who doesn't want to drink that, all you do is mix the essential oils. And I've done this with little kids before. Mix a little bit of peppermint. Uh, lime works really well too. Or bergamot. And you just rub it into the tummy, just rub it in the tummy and it will help to just settle the stomach, relieve the gas and so forth. This is an antifungal blend. This is one that actually Carl taught me. This is a remedy for thrush and fungal infections. You take two drops of either tea tree or kajapu oil. And I prefer for internal use kajapu. Kajapu and tea tree are both melaleucas. Um, they both belong to the Melaleuca genus. It's just Kejapu is a little bit nicer for internal use. It's not quite as harsh. You put two drops of lavender, one drop of thyme, and one drop of lemon, lemon, and you dilute that into one tablespoon of olive oil. Now, the dose for a child is one drop. The dose for an adult is two drops. And you, and you take it twice a day, one drop in the morning, one drop in the evening. It only takes three days and the thrush is completely gone. I would never use it for more than seven days, but I've only done this for like three days. Very, very tiny amount. So this is one case where I have used essential oils internally uh, and, and very, very effectively. Now you could also apply this topically for topical fungal infections. Now here's uh, my friend and business partner, Kimberly Ballas has a hot flash spray. And uh, basically she does this with the hydrosol. And these oils are all running. I didn't write this on the slide, but these are all running in the yin, in the category of being calming to ethereal. Okay. Yang is more masculine. Yin is more feminine. So a lot of the oils that fit over in that floral category are more... Um, conducive to your uh, uh, female hormones, whereas a lot of the ones over in the more spicy yang category actually more conducive to the male hormones, uh, like cinnamon, okay, for the male hormones, uh, whereas geranium and clary sage are more on the female hormones. So you basically uh, mix those essential oils and put them into a little hydrosol spray, and you start to have a hot flash, you spray it around your face, and it helps to cool your body down, it has a cooling soothing effect on your body and also help, has a little bit of an estrogenic effect on your system. <clears throat> now, I mentioned the idea of using uh, essential oils as part of therapeutic baths. And this is a fabulous therapy, absolutely fabulous. Um, you use one to two cups of Epsom salt along with eight to 15 drops of essential oils, primarily the yin oils, the ones that are more floral, uh, and they're and, and very relaxing. My favorites here are lavender rose, chamomile, elang elang, or jasmine. And a lot of people have very severe stress, and that stress uh, causes them to experience anxiety. They can't sleep. They have muscle tension and pain, and stress is depressing their immune system. So this is actually is a therapy for people who have immune problems like cancer. It's not treating the cancer. It's reducing the stress, which is activating the immune system. And the, the, the magnesium and the Epsom salts also helps to really relax the muscles and ease pain. Um, Eli Jones, who was an eclectic physician who wrote a book on treating cancer at the turn of the last century in the early 1900s said that this was his favorite therapy for cancer because he felt that cancer was largely a disease of stress. And he recommended daily Epsom salt baths. And if you add the essential oils, it's really good. So if you're feeling very, very stressed, I recommend doing this. It's fabulous. 
light a candle, put on some relaxing music, and take an Epsom salt bath with essential oils. Dim the lights and, and really let it go for you. Now, this is another little trick. Someone actually on was asking about this on, on Facebook the other day. And um, it's called the Magic Flower Water Spray. Now, what you do is you mix 10 to 20 drops of essential oils with, um, along with either Rescue Remedy, the NSP Distress Remedy, or the uh, uh, FES 5 Flower Remedy, um, all of which are remedies that help a person when they're stressed or in shock or whatever. And you mix those oils into a spray bottle of water, and then you can add some essential oils to that. If you're trying primarily to reduce stress and calm people down, you can put a little lavender or sandalwood in there. If you've got a lot of anger going on, you can uh, put lavender, bergamot, or ylang ylang. If people are sad, put lemon balm or melissa, rose, or pine in there. Now, what you do is you, you mist the room. So originally when I learned about this uh, was just with rescue remedy. You put the rescue remedy in the spray bottle, and a friend of mine told me that they did this, uh, had a friend that did this, and her office, there was a lot of contention and tension. And so every time there was uh, this tension in the office, she would go spray this. And she said, after a week or two, uh, people basically said, um, it's time for you to spray that magic magic water of yours. That's how we made up the magic flower water spray. Now, by adding the essential oils, like if, if you've got a lot of contention in your home, you can pretend this is an air freshener. You can spray it around the house, okay? Uh, or, 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 or there's been depression. You spray it around the house, pretend it's an air freshener. Um, and it really can help to alter the mood. It really can help to reset the emotional tone of your environment. This is a fabulous little technique. Now, um, there are some other... Uh, flower remedies you could use too, but that's that's the main one is is using the rescue remedy or the stress remedy, and then adding the essential oils to kind of help with the specific emotional issues that are going on. The the more yin oils, water oil, and, and some of the more earth grounding oils too, because they 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 float into that yin area. Remember that the earth oils relate kind of to evening and then the yin oils to night. So <clears throat> when you're resting, so that those category of oils can help to put you into sleep. So for example, um, lavender has been used a lot for sleep, but jasmine, chamomile, rose, and along along all can help if you diffuse a little bit at bedtime. Um, can help you relax and unwind to go to sleep. You can also use them as part of one of those baths to help you go to sleep. <clears throat> now, the, the caveat here is that when people are parasympathetic dominant, those oils actually tend to put them more out of balance. And parasympathetic dominant people have very small pupils. And they'll actually find a more young to grounding oils uh, helpful like lemon, lime, frankincense, and myrrh. Um, the oils that really help with deep relaxation, sensuality, playfulness, are often thought of being aphrodisiacs. There are aphrodisiacs that are kind of in the earth category, and there's aphrodisiacs that are in the floral, kind of yin or watery category on my chart. The, the ones that are more earthy kind of put you into the mood of, of making you feel sensual. They, they get you in touch with your body. They, they get you into your body. The ones that are more floral get you into your heart, feeling love or tenderness towards your partner. So if depending on what you want to do with the mood, you can <clears throat> light the candles and give your partner a massage using the appropriate EOs. And it's, again, a good idea to have them smell. I'm going to take a drink of water. The EOs and see how they react to them because you want ones that they go, <clears throat> you know, the, mm, okay, like that too. 
So um, you you <clears throat> do the massage or whatever, and you then basically get the mood going because in order to really be sensually aroused, you have to get into a more parasympathetic dominant state. You 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 um, so the again the earthy to floral oils are are pulling you into the more parasympathetic dominant nervous system state and helping you feel more passionate relaxed and and sensual um the oils that are um more in the refresh what i call refreshing oils which are air oils and a few of the invigorating young oils are really good at helping you stay awake. Um, I, I've done this while driving, taken a drop of peppermint oil and stuck it on the back of my tongue. So it kind of goes up into my sinuses a little bit. Um, <clears throat> and it really helps me, you know, can stay awake if you're feeling a little bit drowsy while you're driving or if you need to like focus and study. Um, and other oils that help with that mental stimulation include rosemary, pine, lemon, and wintergreen that all help you, your brain to be active and alert. So the oils, now this is opposite of what we were just trying to do with the other oils. The, the sensual oils are pulling us into our body, making us connect with our body, with our emotions, with our feelings. This is pulling you up into your head and, and helping you feel more mentally focused. So these are more like air to fire, fire oils, where the sensual oils are more water to earth oils. I hope this is making sense to people. Okay. Uh, a good natural deodorant is to add essential oils either to the enzyme spray, the Nature's Fresh Enzyme Spray, a powdery arsenic lotion or aloe vera gel or a similar product. You can figure out something else. The, the, the powdery arsenic lotion works really nicely. Uh, and then you apply it to your underarms. So you don't want, one of the things you don't want to do is you don't want to use antiperspirant deodorants because when you use antiperspirant deodorants, you're plugging up a major channel of elimination of toxins, which is there, there's a bunch of lymph nodes that are draining off of your this part of your body that, that dump toxins through your sweat, sweat glands in your thing. So if you're, if you're experiencing a lot of body odor, it's because you're dumping a lot of junk here. You plug up those sweat glands, all that backs up in the lymph system, makes you more prone to breast lumps and, uh, and other kinds of problems. So I, one of the things that some women have done is, uh, if they have breast lumps or whatever, is they've started using like the frankincense essential oil, which is really helpful for that. And using that as an underarm deodorant with the, uh, the enzyme spray or the powdery arco lotion. And then uh, you, you basically, this eliminates the odor by killing the bacteria that feed off of the sweat and produce the bad odors. Uh, the only trick is, is that it may only last about four hours and you may have to apply it again to get the effect. Now, this is a trick I learned from Kim. This is absolutely fabulous use for essential oils. A and I've done it and I love it. My, my, um, you know, a lot of times when you're painting uh, and you're inhaling the paint fumes, those are, are chemical solvents, which are highly irritating to your body and to your lungs. If you add 30 to 40 drops of essential oils to the gallon of paint and stir it in, it's really interesting the effect it has. You don't get the, the brain uh, lung irritation that you get from painting when you put the essential oils in there. I'm not sure exactly how that works, but it somehow helps to neutralize some of the toxic effects of the paint at the same time making the paint smell better. And of course it, it, it evaporates as the paint dries, so it doesn't leave your house smelling that forever, but it definitely reduces irritation in lungs and sinuses. And some really good oils to use for that um, are especially the ones in kind of the air quadrant that are refreshing and, and kind of uh, decongesting and so forth. Pine, eucalyptus, uh, rosemary, and but also lavender and lemon are very nice too and just the, the smell that they have. So that's a great little tip for uh, essential oils. 
You could also use essential oils as an air freshener. We kind of hinted at that with the, the magic flower water spray, but you could just basically make a hydrosol. Uh, again, I would recommend using some glycerin to help dissolve the oils. Pick whatever you want and just spray it in the air to, to fuse your house. Um, there are a number of oils that help to repel insects. Um, we know that DEET and other things are actually quite topic. Um, the, the best way to use this is again, make a hydrosol or, or make a, an oil and apply it to your skin, uh, or you can diffuse around the house. Peppermint oil is really helpful for getting rid of ants. My, my daughter worked for uh, a essential oil company. And what she told me is that, you know, the ants have leave a little pheromone trail so that they can, you know, they, they're out looking for food and they find something and then they, they go back to the hive and it cre they create this little trail that the other ants follow to go back to that food source. Well, if you take peppermint oil, ants don't like peppermint oil. Uh, it actually kills them, but it also uh, neutralizes their pheromones so they can't find their trail. So uh, I've had a problem with ants in the kitchen and I've taken and, uh, you know, cleaned off the counters and then I've put a little bit of... Um, peppermint oil into in with a little teeny bit of soap and cleans the countertop with it. And it really helps to discourage and get rid of the ants. Just a few more suggestions for essential oils. Uh, essential oils are really, really useful for cosmetic purposes. And this is not something that I play with a lot, but you know, it's something that, that some people do. You can add essential oils to shampoos, like for example, for dry or oily hair or or dandruff. Uh, I used to have dandruff and used to use a tea tree oil-based shampoo that really worked well for that. Uh, you can also stimulate circulation to the scalp to help uh, prevent hair loss. Uh, and just essential oils can be really good for your scalp. So that's some suggestions there for oils for shampoo. Now, I if you've enjoyed this class, um, and I forgot to put on this slide the... Um, um, the cost, okay. Actually, because maybe I, when I made this presentation, I hadn't finalized that yet. I'm going to do, I'm going to continue along this line with the energetic aromatherapy class that will start on November 29th and also be held on December 5th and 12th. Uh, that This class will cover 50, uh, over 50 fragrances and essential oils. Now, the reason why I say fragrances is because I'm going to talk about things like garlic, for example. Even though you, you don't use garlic as essential oil, it is that it is the aromatic qualities of garlic that you're using. So I'm going to go through the entire wheel, and I'm going to start with ethereal fragrances and go into the air and through the fire and down to the earth and back around to the water and discuss oil, examples of oils from each category, talk about how they're used emotionally and mentally and physically, uh, ways to apply them, practical suggestions for using them, uh, some of my personal stories and experiences with using them. The class is $75 if you uh, uh, pre-register. Um, and it is, it, it, I think it, that goes until, I think, um, the 16th. After that, it's $95. You can go register at treelight.com or you can call our toll-free number, 800-416-287. Plus, I'll also put the information to register for the class uh, in an email to everybody who, who uh, joined tonight and, um, and also up with the, the, the recording for the class if you're interested in continuing to study about um, this approach to essential oils. Um, I... I I, you know, like I said, tonight I've given just uh, tried to give an overview of the subject, uh, and I want to just be able to go more into detail of the essential oils, but I want to also be able to go more into detail with understanding the different qualities of essential oils and what they do as categories, not just uh, as uh, individual oils, but as categories of oils and how they work. Uh, uh, Let's see, someone said that, let me let, double check my calendar here. Oh, sorry, I put the wrong time. 
It's actually the 27th, November 27th. That's right. It's a, that's a, so it's November 27th. Uh, is that right? No, it's the 20. Oh, sorry. It's the 20. I, I, I put the wrong dates. It's the 28th. It's Wednesday. This, uh, I put the dates for the fundamentals class. It's actually the, the, the 28th, the 5th, and the 12th, which is a Wednesday. Oh, dear, I didn't get that right. Okay, November 28th, the 6th, and no, it is the 5th. The, the dates in December are right. It's the 5th and the 12th. Um, okay. And, and again, they, it's uh, $75 pre-registered. And it's also $65 for members. And later, after the pre-registration deadline, it's uh, $99 uh, and, uh, for regular and 75 for members. Uh, our members means people who are members of our uh, stephenhorn.com to our uh, monthly membership program. Okay, so the early bird is 75 uh, then or 65 for members, 99 for regular or 75 for members after, and I'll just double check my calendar again to make sure I'm giving you the right date. Um, after the 16th, that's pre-registration by the 16th of the month. Now, um, I'm going to go ahead and go to like question and answer time, and I'm going to go ahead and stop the slide presentation. So it's just my little old face sitting in front of the camera. Uh, and I'm going to go down. There are some questions. Uh, that people have, have asked. And um, someone asked, what is energy medicine and is it okay for Christians? That's something I have been addressing in my, ment you know, my online emotional healing training program. And absolutely, energy medicine is okay for Christians. In fact, I, I would highly recommend you go to my YouTube channel and look at the Higher Perspective webinar broadcast I did this last Monday. Um, which what, what day of the week would that have been? Monday the um, 5th. Because what I talked about is the idea that we are bioelectrical energetic beings, okay? We are not materialistic beings. There is an energy field that goes through the body and diminution of the energy flowing through different areas of our body is actually part of what causes us to become sick. And so you can, anything that you do to activate energy flow through the body aids the process of healing. And there's um, light and electrical current, even the laying on of hands, okay? Uh, and, and praying for someone is a form of energy medicine. It, it, is, it is not medicine that is uh, based on the material world. It's based on the idea that, that we are energetic beings. And so aromatherapy, you know, fits very well into that. When I talk about energetics, energetics are basically understanding the processes of energy or, or the cycles of energy. And uh, I have found it to be most amazing. So it's, that's a short answer to it, but yes, it's perfectly fine, even though I know that a lot of people who who really get scared of it, they're, they're scared of the idea of yin or yang, and they're scared of all this stuff. It's not about religion. It's about understanding um, the non-material part of ourselves, the, fact, the part of us is energy. I'm not aware of too many EOs that affect hair color, but I do think like there are some of them like chamomile that actually can have a little bit of an effect of like making your hair more blonde and so forth. Um, oh, someone says that, that 
uh, talk to an NSP person who's a professional painter, uses oil and paint, and drinks a lot of milk to remove the toxins. By the way, that was something that my cousin told me to do when I got intoxicated from inhaling um, uh, lacquer thinner. He told me to drink milk. Uh, although I, I would also recommend uh, taking uh, uh, some of the nature sunshines purify or something similar to that and taking something like milk thistle combination or the daily detox or whatever if you're exposed to paint and chemicals like that. Um, I don't have a suggestion for essential oils or, or flower essences for dental amalgam removal. I would suggest for dental amalgam removal that you take like a a heavy metal detox formula and take the Purify, um, or which is now called Ultrabiome DTX and, uh, and uh, the, the new Rejuvenate product, because that's been shown. Uh, the, they actually did a study and showed that the Ultrabiome DTX, uh, Rejuvenate, and Bacillus coagulans taken together actually helped increase heavy metal uh, uh, removal from the body. So that's a good way to deal with that. Um, okay, if, if I there, if you're trying to stimulate your colon because it's sluggish, then you would want to choose essential oils that are more in the the air to fire quadrant because you're wanting to to stimulate activity. And I would choose essential oils like uh, maybe clove or uh, or uh, things of that nature. I have to go back and look at some of what I think would best oils. And you would rub them. And what you want to do is you want to rub in a clockwise motion in the direction of the colon to help stimulate the elimination. So you start, if you're, if you're doing this, you start at the belly button in small circles and you work out until you're rubbing all the way around like this. And the nice thing about rubbing essential oils into your abdomen is also helps with intestinal dysbiosis because it goes in and helps to alter the friendly flora in the gut. EOs are okay to use with young children if you diffuse them briefly into the air. So they're just getting a little bit, not an overpowering, but a little bit of essential oil because again, it, it, uh, it's gonna be safe to inhale. I've, like I said, used essential oils uh, topically, on my kids when they were sick, diluting them in fixed vegetable oil to make sure they were diluted well enough to not be irritating to the skin. And I've rubbed them into the back or belly of you know, young children, including uh, kids that were like maybe only three or four or five months old who had respiratory congestion. And I have not seen any problem with it. The key is that when you're using them for, for little little infants, you probably want to dilute them even more than the two and a half percent dilution. I would dilute them down to 1% uh, and use oils that are, you know, uh, generally considered okay, uh, topically neat. In other words, they're, they're considered safe to use topically without diluting, but you're diluting them down to make them even uh, uh, less irritating for uh, infant. Oh, someone said that milk or half and half can be used to disperse the oils in the bath. That's a great idea because basically because as long as you're using not skim milk, but you're using whole milk or half and half, organic half and half, you just, again, that's got enough fat in it. You can basically uh, mix it in that way and it works great. I also have an idea for like, if you're trying to, if you're wanting to use oils like peppermint oil, you know, maybe some of you have heard that enteric coated peppermint oil helps, you know, kill bad bacteria in the gut and helps the gut heal. Well, a way you can do that, um, that, that I, I've thought of that really works well is you can warm up some coconut oil, you know, because coconut oil is solid. The, the temperature at which it melts is like a little over body, a little over 70 degrees. So if the house is warm, it'll go liquid. If the house is a little cool, it'll go solid. So you just warm it up enough to, to, to melt it, maybe like 80 degrees, not, not anything really hot, but just barely warm. 
add the essential oils in the appropriate dilution into the little bit of coconut oil. And then you basically let it solidify again. And then you take like little bits of it, like maybe a quarter of a teaspoon as a dose and swallow it. The fat helps to bind the oil so that it, until the bile and pancreatic enzymes hit it, hit it and break the oil apart, it won't disperse, thereby transferring the essential oil to the small intestines to work on it. So that's a, an idea that I, you have. Um, let's see, go back and see a lot of things with the people commenting on the, the sound saying, hi, hi, everybody, glad you could join us. Um, someone says, my father had a double vasectomy with the lymph node removal in his right leg. I've been using ginger essential oil and lemon. I was wondering if there was something else I could use to help with lymphatic drainage. Well, internally, I would use lymphatic herbs, red clover, uh, clavers, dandelion, stalingia. And some of the oils that I think are better for lymphatic drainage are uh, not ginger and lemon, which tend to be in the fire category, but actually the ones that are more in the, uh, what I call the uh, ethereal to refreshing category. Um, again, the eucalyptus, the thyme, those oils, which tend to be more opening and dispersing. I, I would favor those for what you're trying to do to promote lymphatic drainage. The problem is, is when the lymph nodes are removed, it's kind of damaged the lymph system and it's hard to get the lymph moving again, um, so forth. I don't know that oils are that useful for broken bones unless they're just not healing. Uh, someone said using LB liquid internally and externally for sluggish colon. Um, I make a spray bottle with two ounces of distilled water plus 25 drops of essential oils for a perfume. That's fine. Um, the thing is, is the essential oils when you're doing that tend to float to the top. They're not water soluble. So the way you get around that is you either add a little bit of glycerin to emulsify the oils, or um, you can also add a little bit of alcohol to emulsify the oils. But like, and, and for a perfume, that might be okay. But like I said, my first aromatherapy teacher, Hakim Chisti, says that uh, alcohol tends to break up the essential oil and it loses some of its more subtle energetic um, progress. The class should be for about the same length this class was, was, which is maybe an hour, a little over an hour, and a little bit of time for a question and answer. So uh, there'll be definitely a good solid three hours of instruction, maybe three and a half or so, plus a question and answer period like um, this. And yes, it's, uh, uh, as I said, it is the 28th, so um, it's okay. Let's see, I'll just go back and check and make sure I've got everything done. Okay. Oh, and, and yes, if you sign up for the class, all the classes I ever do, we record the class. So what that means is, is if you can't attend the class, uh, you can log into our online learning center and get the recording and get the handouts and get all the information afterwards. Um, uh, I can't remember what's in NSP relief settling blend for, so I can't tell you whether that would be good for the colon or not. Uh, the one thing about powdered milk is powdered milk doesn't contain the fat. So I don't know how that would work as far as, uh, helping to dissolve the essential oils because like I said, that they're, they're soluble in fat. So the, the reason why the cream or milk would work is because the fat that's in the, the cream or milk is part, partially emulsified so that it will mix with water, okay? And so that's why that suggestion of using the milk or cream for the bath is, is a really good one. Um, anyway, that's it for the questions we had for tonight. I hope that you enjoyed tonight's class on aromatherapy. I hope you got a lot of really good suggestions for practical use of essential oils, as well as a little bit of understanding about energetics of essential oils. And if you've bought the aromatherapy chart, um, I hope it helps you understand the aromatherapy chart a little bit better. If you haven't purchased the aromatherapy chart, um, it, it's uh, 
on our website at uh, treelight.com and also stephenhorn.com. Uh, it's a nice chart uh, guide to a whole bunch of oils for the um, uh, mental and emotional uses. But uh, in the class, we're going to cover physical uses. And the physical uses also are tied in with the mental and emotional uses with the energetics. So um, the uh, I'd highly we didn't make the class uh, the chart a requirement for the class or, or this class, but I would highly encourage you to get the chart and go over the chart and have it for reference because it really help you to understand essential oils uh, better. You get a mini version, of course, on the slides, but um, the the real chart is you know that big and it has a whole bunch of essential oils on the back. So I think you, that that you'll really enjoy it. Thanks, everybody, for joining me tonight. I'll uh, hopefully catch a lot of you on the class later this month. Good night.